cases reported in the greater Los Angeles area had sexual contact with another case in the United States, including uh, an airline steward from, Cal from Canada who was called patient zero in our, in our investigation. Randy Schultz uh, claimed that he initially was the first case in North America, which wasn't true. And that 40 of the first of the 90 cases that they interviewed had direct sexual contact with another case in the United States. Now, how could this possibly happen? I mean, first of all, these people had to have short incubation period diseases in order to recall that. We didn't know that then because we didn't know what caused this. The chance of this occurring by chance, and then people still believed it. They said, well, this is probably just people who knew each other anyway, and it's all somehow related. But if 5 to 10 percent of men are gay, uh, the chance of this occurring by chance would be 1 times 10 to the minus 12th. Pretty unusual. But still people didn't want to believe this was due to a virus. What proved it to people were cases of pneumocystis occurring in people with no known risk factors who had hemophilia A. And by the time the third case was reported to the CDC, uh, we published an MMWR article in early 1982 and said that we think this is due to an unknown virus. Now why did we feel that way? Well, at the time in the 1980s, uh, hemophilia A and B, uh, which is caused by deficiency to clotting factor 8 or 9, uh, was occurring almost entirely in men and young boys. And uh, there were about 25 to 30,000 cases of moderate to severe hemophilia A or B in the United States. This is a horrible disease for kids and for, and for young men. And in fact, before the early 1970s in the United States, uh, it was very common for little boys to fall down, bleed into their joints, have strokes, be hospitalized, and die very young, or be crippled and in wheelchairs for much of their life. They would go to their specialist after they fell down, and he would give them cryoprecipitate from his freezer, often too late, uh, but, and they would be hospitalized very often. But there was a breakthrough with the extraction of factor eight and nine uh, and a concentration into concentrates in the early 1970s in which the Food and Drug Administration said, we're worried about unknown viruses, so you have to pool this from as many as 1,000 to 25,000 donors per lot. And this was then freeze-dried or lyophilized, put in there, and, they, and factor eight or nine was given prophylactically. Um, Hemophiliacs had a dramatic improvement in their lifestyle because they always had factor eight or factor nine floating around if they had access to it. Uh, ironically, in, in the United States, I don't know if ironically is the right word, but populations that were uninsured and populations that were poor underrepresented minorities ended up getting much less AIDS because they had less access to factor eight and, and nine. But each hemophiliac would be exposed to as many as 250,000 donors per year. So what a perfect setup for a new virus for which antibodies wouldn't work. And, and, and therefore, and the other thing is that all of the hemophiliacs got hepatitis B and what was then known as hepatitis non-A, non-B. That was small, thought to be a small price to pay uh, to avoid the hospitalizations due to that, although they also got cirrhosis and other things, but less bad than the ravages of hemophilia. What this did was prove to everybody in medicine that this was due to a virus which was now in the blood supply. Everybody then believed it. And that allowed us to do, I think, the most important thing we did at CDC, and that is issue prevention recommendations ahead of the uh, isolation of the virus and the known cause. And the first group was in late 1982 when we had recommendations for clinical and laboratory staff. In the US at the time, doctors and nurses would refuse to care for people with AIDS because they were so concerned about it. They didn't know what to do to prevent it. There were major doctors, including one head of orthopedics at San Francisco General who said, I'm going to instruct my residents not to operate on people with AIDS. They shouldn't have to do that. 
There were people who refused to take care of pregnant women with AIDS. In the Grady Hospital in Atlanta, people would refuse to take trays in to people with AIDS. There was a, it went from a complacency to complete panic in the situation. So our guidelines initially were guidelines similar to hepatitis B prevention. If you do what you do to protect yourself from hepatitis B, you will undoubtedly protect yourself from AIDS. It was not casually transmitted. You didn't get it from going to a restaurant where there was a gay waiter. You didn't get it from having your cousin over for dinner. And there were people who would come in my office who were told by their parents not to come home for Thanksgiving. The first doctor in the family in New York came and asked me if I could find him a place to stay because his parents told him not to come home because they were so afraid that he might transmit whatever it was. So the guidelines for staff were good, and then shortly thereafter, there were recommendations that were picked up virtually everywhere in the United States and then throughout uh, the world on prevention of AIDS. We, the first thing we did was change the name of our task force to the task force on AIDS. And we did that because we thought acquired immune deficiency syndrome was more, um, was more uh, descriptive. And, and I'll tell you, frankly, we wanted an acronym people would remember. I mean, it, so you can say that that was bad, but we did it. And, and then we had interagency recommendations, and the recommendations included recommending that people who are at increased risk for AIDS, and at this time in the United States, it was gay men injecting drug users, heterosexual partners of people, because there were some heterosexual cases, and also recent Haitian entrants to the United States that had a greatly increased risk of AIDS that they avoid multiple sexual partners and avoid contact with, sexual contact with people with AIDS, and that all of them refrain from donating blood or plasma. At the time, we broke down the blood banks, which had been refusing investigation, and we found that about 30% of the cases for which there was no known risk um, were associated with blood transfusions. And there were people who had as many as 50 blood transfusions. When we investigated the cases, we found in virtually every case there was a single donor who had evidence of immune abnormalities, who had very mild symptoms, even when they were investigated many years after the transfusion. So a man, for ex usually a man, would get bypass surgery, 20 units of blood. Three years later, they'd develop pneumocystis and then die we would get their blood and then we would go investigate the donors and in each case we'd find a single donor who uh, had donated blood many years before who still essentially had no symptoms or mild symptoms uh, but had immune abnormalities in the tests. And we thought that this was very good evidence that it was in a single blood transfusion and disturbingly that it was being transmitted by asymptomatic people who actually gave blood to people who subsequently died before their symptoms even developed. But what we hoped was, this was the iceberg, this was the form frost. We get blood from these people and then, then other people could be protected like they were. Not true, unfortunately. 1983, Francois Barre, Sanus, and Luc Montagnier and their colleagues isolated a virus in Paris uh, from a man who had traveled to New York uh, who had lymphadenopathy. Um, Dr. Gallo and his colleagues a year later published uh, results on a virus they called HTLV-3, uh, and these were lentiviruses of the retrovirus type. Um, and then three years later, after a lot of fighting, uh, a, a consensus panel renamed the virus HIV instead of HTLV-3 or LAV. A lot of controversies about this, and I think this is a, a, one of the other lessons from HIV is that when scientific topics heat up, uh, the competition heats up, and the, and the public light shines on the investigators who are in the controversy. And this is a, not a good time in American medicine and science um, because it turned out that HTLV-3 was not only the same type of virus, but actually was the same isolate that had been shared with Dr. Gallo's lab by Dr. Montagnier. Now, Dr. Montagnier had partly been trained in, in, at, at the National Cancer Institute, but it turned out that the virus that was not only isolated by Dr. Gallo, but was patented by the United States and shared with pharmaceutical companies throughout the world was actually LAV, and the American lawyers for the French, 
uh, extracted the credit and the money from the U.S. government. And in 2007, uh, Drs. Montagnier and Barre Sinus received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the discovery of the cause of AIDS. Of AIDS. I believe that Dr. Gallo did this on purpose, but it was true. So the CEC had collected by that time thousands and thousands of specimens from a variety of investigations, and we were anxious to use the new tests to discover the natural history of HIV and to sort of uncover the iceberg. And what I'm going to tell you about are two studies we did that are the most depressing of all the studies in the history of AIDS, <laughs> or one of the most depressing. First of all, we went back to those transfusion-associated cases I mentioned. And we went back, hope, hopefully, to find out what the immune response was in these donors. And unfortunately, Dr. Fiorino and colleagues found out that all of these gay men who were single donors were persistently infected. That is, the positive antibody test of people who were asymptomatic many years earlier who transmitted this to people who subsequently died showed that these people were still infected and they were getting progressively more immunocompromised, but they persistently had it, that a positive antibody test actually was indicative of a current and long-term lifelong infection. That wasn't bad enough, though. The worst thing is that, as I mentioned before, several of us had been engaged in, in uh, studies in gay men and hepatitis B. And the reason we did this is we were conducting a vaccine trial with hepatitis B with gay men throughout the country. The largest group we studied was in San Francisco. And we went back and got permission. We collected almost 7,000 uh, vials of blood from gay men in San Francisco in 1978. And then we were going to have the people who were negative for hepatitis B were going to be in, in, enlisted or in offered enlistment in the hep hepatitis trial. When we went back and tested the blood, got permission to test the blood from 1978 to 1984, a year before the test was licensed, but when we had access to the antibody test. And this tells us one of the most important truths and most depressing truths about HIV. Now here it's called HTLV3-LAV. This is in the dispute era. And what you see with the uh, bar is that back in 1978, already, 4.5% uh, of men were HIV positive in San Francisco. By the time the first cases of AIDS, those, those five cases of pneumocystis in 1981 were reported from L.A., that year, there, on the right, there were four cases of AIDS in the San Francisco cohort out of 7,000 men. But already, 37% of these men were infected with HIV, had antibody. And by the time... There were 26 cases in 1984, 67% of men were infected. Now this is a year before the test was commercially available. And I'm not saying these 7,000 men were typical of all men in San Francisco, but they weren't that different either. Two thirds of gay men were infected with a virus that we already know would persist for life. And the longer they were infected, the more likely they would be immunocompromised. It also means if you extrapolate, uh, this is a dangerous thing to do, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, if, you, if you talk about those five cases uh, in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, that there were likely already 250,000 gay men in the United States infected with HIV by 1981. And before the antibody test was available on the market, when people could be diagnosed by their doctor, more than half a million gay men were infected in the United States. Uh, almost all of those men have died. And it means that just like in an individual, the antibody and the virus precedes disease, so also in a community it does that. And that's done that in every community throughout the world. And almost all public health officials and people in society have denied it. I can remember going to Nigeria when people say it's going to be different here. The 4 or 5% positivity doesn't mean anything. They wait till people are dying in the streets and dying in the hospital before they say this is a big problem and by then thousands and thousands of people are affected 
with the disease. Maybe it's the same way with diabetes. We wait till people seriously affected. What does this glucose abnormality mean? Uh, yeah. Of course, it, this is not just a disease of the United States, and I'm not going to try to get into the global epidemic, only to say that we were fortunate in, a previ in, our, in our previous lives, Dr. Piat is with the London School of Hygiene, and I, who was with CDC, established a partnership in Kinshasa, Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, to set up under Dr. Jonathan Mann's leadership the largest uh, HIV research project in the continent. Um, and in his first papers in 1984, he showed that in Kinshasa, Zaire, which many people consider to be one of the birthplaces of, of the AIDS epidemic, already uh, AIDS was a one-to-one -one ratio of male to female and was uh, 30 times more common than it would ever be uh, in the United States. Dr. Mann went on to uh, leave this project to begin a small global AIDS program at the World Health Organization, which grew into the largest program in the, in the World Health Organization, uh, to resign in, uh, in protest when the Director General of the WHO was uh, not giving the support that he thought he needed, and then to go on to Harvard and then uh, Drexel University and, and, and more about him later. But he was the person who most equated the fight for AIDS to, um, to the fight for human rights. And I think that's an important issue when it comes to all public health problems and to think about that. And, you know, to think that you could have a new disease become the leading cause of death in the continent of Africa when the continent already had the highest mortality rates in the world. A new disease would come and kill adults, not children, and be more common than anything that killed children. It's almost unconscionable. But people didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want to, they didn't want to deal with it because a new problem always requires a strategic and resilient and relentless Srinath Reddy, and Jonathan Mann was one of those people. So what are the lessons? Well, the first lesson is that excellent surveillance is critical. It's critical initially to track epidemics and to direct the etiologic investigations. Once it was found that this was due to a virus that focused the scientists to look for the cause, and then to formulate prevention recommendations. It's also extremely important to evaluate prevention efforts and to target prevention and care resources. And this is a lot harder to do than it sounds like because everybody wants a piece of the pie once the pie is served. Biologic and social factors favor the insidious spread and long-term endemicity. I've mentioned a lot of these already, but just to reiterate them quickly. The major problem with HIV is the virus itself. It's a silent infection. There's a long period between infection, symptomatic illness, and death. This is true in an individual, silent infection and infectivity. Still, the vast majority of infections in the world, even to this day, are transmitted from people who don't know they have it to other people who don't know they have it. People are having sex in a sea of ignorance, and, and that's the central problem. But it's also true in a community where the prevalence greatly exceeds the incidence and the epidemic is insidious. HIV persists for the life of the human host. These are obvious things, but a lot of times we forget them because we get focused on another factor. It's highly stigmatizing. Many diseases are. We were discussing cancer earlier in the week. Why is it stigmatizing? Well, you know, we all have sex. Some of us use drugs. I don't, but some of us do. Um, and, but we don't talk about it. You know, it's ubiquitous, but we don't talk about it. And anything dealing with sex or drugs is stigmatizing, including the doctors and nurses and people who work on those problems. You know, that person is an STD doctor. That person is an AIDS doctor. The other thing is that people shun people who are dying, who look awful. And the worst AIDS patients are like uh, the very debilitated uh, Holocaust survivors or cancer survivors. People are afraid of AIDS. They're afraid to go near people, and that, that keeps people away. HIV preferentially affects the poor. I'm reminded that the poor don't vote very often. I don't think they vote in any country. Uh, our head of health policy said, you know, the reason we have so many uninsured people 
is that 95% of voters are insured and the uninsured don't vote. So therefore, they're, they're doing that. That's a problem because competing priorities of the poor, we, we have our own priorities for the poor. Right now, one of the lessons is that AIDS is a priority for the poor in Africa. There's a lot of funds for that. Now, those things change though. It used to be malaria, it could be something different. But the poor themselves have priorities like eating and housing and trying to get around and raise their families. And of course, there's less political support. Status of women in most societies. I would say that uh, we can be, uh, I don't want to say proud, but I think in the United States, women come closest to being equal in sexual power or maybe some other countries, but they're not quite there. Uh, politicians still regulate women's bodies. Uh, and in, in many countries of the world, women have almost no sexual power. And I know I, I don't know much about India, but I read about some of the problems you have here in terms of sexual inequality when it comes to things like rape. And this is a big problem when it comes to dealing with a problem like AIDS. HIV attacks the immune system. You can think of having 40 million human incubators out there and new infections pop up in those incubators. The most obvious one that's been a huge worldwide problem is the transmission of multi-drug resistant TB, primarily in Africa, from HIV infected people around there. So this increases the morbidity from other conditions and it does what I call enhances the effect of other poverty related conditions. And I'll just give one example of this. In the United States in 1985, as soon as the virus was discovered, we pulled together a task force that strongly recommended against breastfeeding for women with AIDS or HIV. And that was because we knew HTLV 1 and 2 was transmitted that way. We thought there was a chance it'd be transmitted to babies. Well, subsequently over the years, it was found that in breastfeeding societies, primarily Africa, that the risk of transmission from a mother to a newborn went from 25% to 35% or more. That meant, until therapy was available, that breastfeeding would kill not 10% of the babies of women with AIDS. Now that would seem like a no-brainer, but even now, the risks to not breastfeeding in the developing world where breastfeeding is, is most common are seen to at least mitigate or, or partially mitigate the risk. And breastfeeding is still very, very common in countries where prevalence of HIV in women exceeds 20 or 30 percent. In countries in Asia, stopped immediately. Thailand just said, no breastfeeding, because they weren't quite as poor and they had better organization. But why would anybody breastfeed with HIV if you had access to safe formula and safe water and antibodies and vaccinations and medical care. There's still no effective vaccine or curative therapy. Another major lesson with AIDS is that innovative science can overcome skepticism. When I was, at, first of all, the virus was discovered rather quickly and this is the first human retrovirus of, of the lentivirus type. It took longer to name it than it did to discover it. Advances in diagnostic testing. Who would have thought there would be something like uh, uh, a viral load that could be done quite easily in the developing world? I mean, that's unheard of. There were no antiretroviral drugs. A cancer drug named AZT was discovered in Michigan, too toxic for cancer, was shown to be partially effective in treating AIDS. Uh, a very courageous group of uh, pediatricians from Canada and the United States and France showed that by giving AZT to pregnant women uh, during pregnancy, during delivery, and to the newborn afterwards could prevent perinatal transmission completely by two-thirds. This has now been advanced to preventing it by close to 90, 95%, but controversial. And then finally, the use of three antiretroviral drugs of two classes uh, instituted in 1995 can create uh, an almost normal lifespan to people, first in the developed world at the cost of ten to twelve thousand dollars, and then thanks to the great generic companies in India, uh, was spread.